And you think those are more coupled than they are uncoupled, those pathways? Or do you think that, uh, I mean, there are clearly situations in which external stressors can perturb more than one of those. But like senescence seems somewhat uncoupled from nutrient sensing, doesn't it? Uh, it may, but I... And I'm not asking that rhetorically. Like, I just I just don't know. Well, the, no, know. The, the answer is we, we think that we've found an explanation for all of these things to happen. A unifying theory? Right. Uh, so I've kept it close to my vest for a number of years, but it actually goes all the way back to the Sirtuin story in yeast. And hopefully the, the listeners who've stuck with this podcast uh, are still with us because they, this they is will. the punchline. I, yeah, they, I promise you they are with us. So the punchline is that, so this is all off, off the top of my head here. We haven't published this yet, but I'm, I'm going to tell you my, my thoughts and your listeners. So the genome is digital information. It's uh, very easy to preserve. It's the reason we went from analog to digital in the 2000s. DNA is four letters, it's digital, it's easy to replicate, it's easy to store, you can boil it, it's very robust. And so what we've actually come to discover is that the genome is fairly intact in old people and old animals. We've sequenced the genomes of lots of old mice and all the genes are still largely intact. So what's going wrong? Well, the other part of information that you inherit from your parents is the epigenetic information. Okay, And I use that term loosely, but basically it means what's the pattern of gene expression? which genes are turned on and off at which time. And that is analog information. Okay, That has to be analog because instead of just being a single code, it has to operate in three dimensions, actually four if you count time. And so that's an analog system, and it's constantly adapting to what we eat, what we, what we drink, if we run, when we sleep. And you have to turn genes on and off all the time. But that pattern of gene expression that's set down when we're young because it's analog, analog information doesn't last very long. Anyone who's had a record player or magnetic tape knows that these things don't last. And that's the problem, I think, with aging, is that we don't lose the digital information. So the compact disc of our lives is still intact when we're old, but it's as if we've got a scratched CD and the cells don't read the right genes at the right time anymore and they lose their identity. In fact, if we, there's an analogy which is called Waddington's Landscape where in the 1950s, Waddington drew a picture, it's a beautiful picture of some hills, it's a mountainscape, and cells actually roll down the mountainscape and land in different valleys down below. And that's to, you know, before we had he had access to the genome, that was his way of saying this is how cells know what they are. They land in these valleys and they stay there. But what I think is happening during aging is, due to the vibration of noise over time, we lose that pattern of gene expression. We lose that information, epigenetic information, and those cells or those marbles in Waddington's landscape, they jump over into different valleys and lose their identity. So your neurons are not functional like neurons anymore. Your liver cells are more like neurons. And we see that in our lab. We're just writing up a couple of papers right now for this. And we're able to actually manipulate the epigenome in cells and in mice and have a look what happens to those animals. And the prediction is that you get all the hallmarks of aging. You know, the challenge with this entire space is you think back to the time in the 1950s when he made, when he created that analogy. And it's, in some ways, it's amazing that it could still be relevant 75, 80 years later, whatever it is. On the other hand, it, it humbles you to realize how much more has been learned about that process in that time. And sometimes I think about it because you and I are interested in the same problem that I'm worried I just don't know anything. You know, I'm worried that in 10 years I'll look back at my hypotheses and my, un or not even my hypotheses, just my understanding of the current state of the art today and think, you know what, that was directionally right, but it was so oversimplified and oh my goodness, like, you know, so, so it's sort of like we're back in this problem of time, like we're going to run out of time. And I mean, how confident are you that in, because you and I are almost the same age, like how confident are you that in our lifetime, we will see step function changes in human longevity? And to put this in context, there really hasn't been a step function change in human longevity, probably since the introduction of sanitation. I mean, everything has been quite incremental, maybe antibiotics, vaccinations, antibiotics have probably been the last step function change. Will we see one in our lifetime? How confident are you? I'm, I'm getting more and more confident. Honestly, when I, I started in this field, I thought we'd probably not see the type of technologies that I'm seeing now. It's making my head spin, not just in the technologies, but also the uh, 
the investment and the number of people working on this now. This was the back order of biology when we started. And there's been some new results, which I'll just hint upon because um, we haven't published and it's very early, but I've seen, it sounds like a, a scene out of Blade Runner, but I've seen things you wouldn't believe. No, it's, <laughs> it's maybe not that dramatic, but let me go back to the compact disc analogy. You've got the scratched CD. How do you find the polish? What is that? Let's go back to the yeast analogy. What causes those scratches? Why do you get loss of gene regulation? Anyone who was paying attention earlier on in this conversation will remember that these DNA breaks in the chromosome, broken chromosomes, distract the sura complex and they move away and you get the expression of genes that have no right being on. In because the sirtuins have lost, they're, they're distracted from the deactivation function and they're dealing with the repair function. Exactly. So using that, what we've got a lot of evidence for now is that something very similar, if not essentially identical in principle, happens in mammals as we age. And what that means is that insults to the genome, and one of the major insults is a double strand break, but there are probably others, cause these proteins, sirtuins and other factors, I'm not saying only sirtuins, but factors that control gene expression, silencing and other things, have a dual role, we know, in DNA repair and other things, such as responding to stresses, heat, whatever. But this is the cell's way of coordinating gene expression changes, hunkering down during times of adversity and going off to repair the system, which in this case we study DNA breaks. And that's a beautiful system when you're young. It works great. You get exposed to cosmic rays or you go out in the sun, you've got lots of DNA breaks. Eventually these proteins will go repair those breaks and then go back to where they came from to settle down the response to turn off the inflammation, to turn off the DNA repair when it's not needed. But the problem we think is it's antagonistic pleiotropy. Okay, so Peter Medawar and the other brilliant scientists in the 50s speculated, I think correctly, is that things that are really good for you when you're young come back to bite you in the ass when you're older. And I think that's what's happening here is that this response to these stresses, like a break, end up not just distracting these proteins, but end up disrupting the actual structure of our chromatin and these proteins don't always go back to where they came from 100%. Do that for 70 or 80 years, and it's not surprising that the genes that were once perfectly programmed and turned on at the right time lose their ability to do that. And we've got remnants of that program when we're at 70 and 80. But what's exciting is that information is still there to be accessed. The question is, how do you get the cells to remember to access at the right time? What's that polish? And I think we're pretty close to finding that. 